Hey, Raj, thanks for coming on this interview today. And we have a few questions for you. And for the folks at home who don't know who Raj is, Raj is a dude in college, I believe somehow got involved in GameStop somewhat early. And today we're going to find out how he got involved with the stock and ultimately what he decided to do with his shares. I genuinely do not know the answer to these questions yet. I know Raj from Twitter. We talk about stocks. I know he got involved with GameStop stock somewhat early because I actually started to hear about GameStop stock from him. I remember him sending me a chart when I think GME hit 50 for the first time. And my response was, wow, that looks super bullish, but I'm not touching the stock. And wow, I could have made a lot of cash in retrospect. Well, enough of my missed opportunity. Let's get into the interview. First of all, how did you get involved with GameStop stock? Yeah, so first, uh, actually, this goes back to March. Because there's a time where I was just, uh, I used to go on r slash penny stock subreddit. And I just used to like, see how they traded the penny stocks and how it worked. Because the most of the time they're, the penny stock stocks are really just not that good of uh, companies and they're just shorted pretty much like GameStop, but just not 100 and, you know, 40%. So I used to, yeah, I used to uh, lurk on those uh, subreddits. So that's also like when I used to just look up tech we use around the house and what people have and like the stores we would visit just to see what their stock was and, you know, just to look at stock prices, it's just something I did for fun. I, I don't. I don't think that's normal, but yeah. Cool, cool. And so you've stumbled across GameStop on that. Yeah, I stumbled across GameStop on that. Uh, I saw that it had the huge short interest at one thirty-eight percent, one forty percent, and yeah, uh, it didn't make any sense because uh, I mean, the most I've seen shorted was what seventy uh, percent on those penny stocks, and uh, even when I looked online, there was no real answer about. Uh, stocks being shorted over 100% because theoretically you can only short the float. So it actually got shorted over the actual float or does it get to 100 plus percent because of the fact that insiders are holding those and they're not selling? Uh, I believe the float number was like uh, the shorted amount was like somewhere around 70 million oh, wow. uh, shares. I think there's only like 60 something, right? Okay, so the free float is 50 point. 68 million and yeah yeah their shares outstanding is 69.75 million so yeah the 19 million are just you know with insiders and right right can't really trade those so that's super cool so you located this and is this like a user that you happen to like follow or you just stumbled into seeing someone's thesis essentially on the short interest and you read that there and you basically cross-referenced and you looked into the interesting opportunity based on the short interest basically. Is that is that kind of right? It didn't really occur to me that I should get into it when it was like $3, $5. Because <laughs> uh, at that moment I was learning about, you know, pretty much everything. It's also a time where like I... I got into investing, so I wasn't trading at that time, but I was just looking at companies. And then I found GameStop, and then I just looked at it, because it kind of made sense at that point, because, you know, the bear thesis is uh, they're brick and mortar, uh, they, they're not really doing that well, and they don't have, like, an online presence as much, and, well, that's, that's not true, as I found out, but... At that moment, there, it, it didn't occur to me that I should buy in at that point because I was still learning about stuff. So I didn't want to put up capital where I didn't think it would be beneficial for me. What was the turning point? Like, when did you make that switch to, to actually finally jump into GameStop? So I used to watch the penny stocks. And so I was kind of like paying attention to it and learning about the short squeezes uh, and like kind of just watching the short squeezes. So I started keeping more of an eye out on it when it started leaving the five dollar range then we saw it go up to 20 and then it jumped up to 38 dollars so i'm paying attention during this whole time and looking at how it's acting as a stock and this was back in um let me see this was back in looking at the chart two right now it's 20 to 30 dollars okay so this was earlier in january right yeah so during this okay so around august when i started to keep like, the, as the stock price grew, my attention towards the stock grew, if that makes sense. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Because it was under five bucks, you were saying, and then it got over five bucks, and you were like, okay, I'm going to keep track of this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of my original, like, 
plan was to enter the stock. I thought it would just do a squeeze and then die back down uh, like most of those penny stocks. Right. But but so I I didn't really buy into it because I, I wasn't a penny stock trader and I didn't want to risk it. Yeah, so I watched those short squeezes and see what they look like. What were some of the other short squeezes that happened that kind of like you were thinking that, oh, this might be the next one because you saw these other ones that were similar that occurred? The only short squeeze uh, I had taken part in, uh, up to now was in BYFC, so Broadway Financial. So during uh, all the BLM stuff, uh, I believe, there, I think it was a Tuesday, it was some sort of like day. It's been a long time since I've looked at that chart because... Yeah, once I'm done with the trade, I just don't look at the company again. So, you know, if it went up a lot or, yeah, I don't want to feel like I missed out and buy back in. Nice. So, yeah, and then I thought it would be uh, this short squeeze would kind of. So that was the that was what I thought it would look like first. It was just one big spike and then come back down. And then now we have uh, Ryan Cohen and his uh, and the other people from Chewy come in. So there's this whole thing where they're gonna, you know, fix GameStop and change how they're uh, how they do business, uh, essentially, to make them more successful in the e-commerce space. And so then I started to, you know, think that it would look more like a like the chart of Tesla, where it's you know just you see them actually like hitting their goals, and then. You, you see a bunch of people who are bears essentially turning to bulls. Um, yeah, so similar to how Tesla, Workhorse, uh, Neo, uh, FUV, similar to how those uh, kind of just, you see that spike, it comes back down a little bit and then it slowly keeps going back up. When were you thinking that that change might happen like this might not be like a byfc and this might be more like a, a fuv or tesla that change happened when i saw uh, ryan cohen and the two other board members join yeah uh, and i believe we got three new members uh let's see yesterday uh from amazon and another one from chewy Oh, wow. Yeah, so now I'm actually pretty bullish on GameStop, and it looks like the volatility came back today, so I'm pretty... I'm just keeping an eye on it now, but I did exit my position, by the way. So what price did you buy in, and then what were the factors that got you to leave the position? I entered around 35. That was because I saw the stock price go from, let's see, uh, it was like, yeah... So it was like $36 to 40 something dollars. Yeah, 30, yeah. It yeah, jumped $10 in a day and I saw how it like quickly went right back down and I was like this kind of seems a little suspicious to me. Yeah, so I decided to go in to GameStop in case there was a short squeeze that was going to happen and here we are. Nice. And then when were you able to exit the position? I started exiting around ninety dollars. And was this on the on the run up or was this on the run down? It was it was on the run down, yeah, unfortunately so. Okay. And then what I guess in terms of like your plan of when you were gonna leave this stock and then did anything change along the way? And then also how did you decide to leave at ninety? So I was originally going to leave uh when it opened at 140 i thought it would get some support around 145 if we do see it go down but we just opened at uh 140 on the 2nd of february so i should have got got out around that price but i didn't i didn't stick to my trading strategy and i got back in today so now my cost basis is a total of 51 dollars and 18 cents in terms of like just the things that we're seeing right now and and, and yeah. so you told me that you're more of a long-term investor and then but these you were following these penny stocks and that was pretty interesting well i guess i guess before we get into the current events in terms of your view of of reddit and and uh going on reddit like i think people have a pretty interesting view depending on if they actually mm-hmm. went on wall street bets before or not like it's 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 actually contrary to popular belief 
it's pretty boring and not too organized as people might think. And so do you have yeah, like a strategy yeah. in terms of like, do you follow specific users or like in terms of how do you go through and consume the content there? Uh, may- mainly just to look at the beams. I mean, nice. <laughs> I don't take any of the, yeah, I don't take any of the, uh, stock posts seriously. Uh, I'll look into it myself. if I think it sounds credible, but I mean, the memes are about the like, only thing that make it better. I did learn about gamma hedge or gamma squeezes and delta hedging uh, from there. So I think that's the only thing I've taken seriously. I think that's something that people are kind of missing, though. Like most people, including myself, will look there for like just these crazy things that happen, whether they're basically their portfolio goes to like, a, you know, millions of dollars or, or basically they lose. Generally speaking, it goes to millions and then it goes to zero or something, something crazy like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's kind of you don't really want to do what they do, sort of thing. And then so Reddit, I think the biggest problem was uh, all these posts later that started popping up with like the buy and hold GameStop, like you should buy and hold Diamond Hands, buy, buy, buy. That that really got annoying super fast that's actually a really good point and and in terms of like the most detriment in terms of like because i saw this starting to happen and i i even remember talking to you like you know i was like i was just like or on you know on twitter i was like you know you can hold one share you know you can you can sell the rest because people have this misconception that if i sell my shares it's going to cause a stock price to go down but people are not really thinking that there's every time someone's selling there's a buyer. The only scenario where it actually makes a difference is if you actually held 1%, 2% of the float. And it, 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 when you sell that, it fills up the buy orders. You know, basically, there's more than that's on the, that can be bought, and then it causes a drop in price. But generally speaking, because I know that at my own company, at a company meeting one time, someone was like, oh, what if I sell all my company's stock in terms of like an employee stock purchase program? And the, and the person in terms of who's like in charge of the finances there responded saying, oh, well, if you sell the stock, someone's going to buy the stock. It's not going to make the stock price go down at all. So don't worry about that. You know, so that's an interesting, I just, and this is, these kind of things are not so surprising if people don't necessarily like know these things because people don't even know in general, like what a market cap is and, and a lot of, you know, kind of financial things are. So it's not so surprising if people think, oh, I need to hold this because the stock price is going to go down. Oh, and that, this is, might not be something that people are actually even thinking about. I'm just kind of wondering what it is that people are thinking about. And these folks that have millions of dollars who are holding, it's okay for them to do that, but to make it so public and make, because it, it's actually gain, you gain a huge following from, I'm holding this from like, whether it's 30 million or even some people that have like a 1 million, but then you have all the people who are following them. It's almost like, because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen like a bunch of, you know, YouTubers are not great in the financial space and for many reasons, but I haven't, in this case, most YouTubers seem pretty responsible. They're not trying to say, don't sell it. They're basically being on the conservative side of this whole situation from what I've at least seen. So it's pretty interesting that these folks though, who are kind of these like, you know, like deep effing value, he's this kind of seen as really taking leadership. I think that was another big problem I saw with this whole thing was people like, he wasn't he wasn't a leader or anything he was he just made a value play because he saw it wasn't trading at a multiple to, of what they made the revenue and what their sales were he saw that the the multiple it was like trading at 1.19 times uh the multiple instead of like the usual 1.5 yeah for retail stocks and yeah so he bought he bought because of that and people in the comments uh, of his post uh, on Wall Street Bets, everyone made fun of him. So he wasn't, he's not really a leader. He just, he just kind of opened everyone's eyes to what GameStop had for potential. And this was before Ryan Cohen got on board. So. Uh-huh. so he was, yeah, he was really just looking at the financials purely. And yeah, but that's why basically he made his position. The people later picked up on how shorted the stock was and, and why the, buying this is, you know, such a huge potential. Thanks for that perspective. And because, you know, oftentimes some of these people are thought of as more of these leaders. The other question I have is in terms of 
the media's perspective on this whole situation. And also, I guess, oh, gosh. their push on this situation, their kind of villainizing of Reddit and the folks there, and kind of maybe, maybe sympathizing with the hedge funds, and even with the whole silver debacle. Do you have any thoughts on <laughs> pick, pick any or pick them all? <laughs> yeah, I'm still kind of, you know, processed and confused, annoyed about this whole thing. Because it, it's like, and what do you have to gain from, you know, from like vilifying people who are just buying the stock because they see it shorted to 140%. So the broker just halting uh, GameStop, AMC, BlackBerry, and Nokia was, that's what threw me off. Uh, and that's what kind of made me, that. that's also like going back to uh, trading strategy with GameStop. It, it also kind of made me, uh, my judgment cloudy because it, made me angry and felt personal about the whole thing. Not the greatest thing to happen. And the worst part is seeing uh, Vlad, uh, Robin Hood CEO, go on CNBC and say that there's no uh, liquidity problem. And it's like, yeah, so you are you have a liquidity problem. Why are you lying to the news and to pretty much everyone that you don't have a liquidity problem? That's what makes me not want to use Robin Hood anymore from uh, because of this whole situation. And with Robin Hood and this whole situation, and, and yeah, that's that's the biggest unfortunate thing on, on his end, whether it was just he thought it was not so big of a deal and he could just sweep this under the table and, and that would be the end of that because he probably didn't, at that point, maybe he didn't know how big of a deal this whole situation was and he thought that it's a single interview, I'll just say what I want to say and that's about it and didn't need to think he needed to be so transparent probably. But in general and then now that it's been you know probably only a few days but i believe i believe he did two interviews he did he did he did a couple interviews there and then i i uh, also he did clubhouse with with elon which was probably the best interview but then also i think it was last night i, I saw an interview with him with me kevin as well did you happen to see that interview i have not watched no i have not watched that one or the one with elon definitely recommend watching it i mean it's not it's not like he's at least honest or at least more honest about what it is with the liquidity issue and the billions of dollars that were requested from him. Definitely interesting to hear. Plus it was fun to see Elon like ask such blunt questions like, are you being held hostage? Blink twice. And also things like how much are you beholden to Citadel? You know, like these, these blunt questions that were just epic. And even with meet Kevin, he asked some questions about crypto. And then with that, destroy your business and is that why you're not answering this question you know some things like that but basically i was i applaud vlad for going to these platforms to being more transparent he still sounds a little bit like a robot and that, that's kind of unfortunate but it is probably who he is so i can't like bash him too much for that because that's just who he is but <laughs> you can't ask someone to be emotional who is incapable i'm just joking but so the thing is now that a few you know days has gone by what is your thoughts on robin hood should there be impacts to robin hood and or other brokerages too uh, i think we only saw this problem with uh brokerages that were new and not as capitalized like robin hood weeble uh because weeble did say that they weren't gonna allow trading of uh that we could only sell gamestop uh on the night of the night before it hit uh 480 and I think that was cleared up by by the morning, so I don't, that was I guess they figured it out. But yeah, Robinhood definitely should have gone, uh, just been honest from the beginning. I'm pretty sure that like, there's a few other brokerages, including E Trade, that also uh, at least on the Thursday that the you know important Thursday that they they restricted trading of at least GameStop the entire day. I'm pretty sure. I think TD Ameritrade also okay. did. So the ones that didn't stop trading were Fidelity and Vanguard. And I do want to move to those brokerages because they're much more capitalized. So situations like this in the future, if they do happen, they'll be fine. But their trading platforms aren't the best, I'd say, for mobile. I think that's a really good point and a really fair point in terms of why one would want to move to these platforms. It's not necessarily to spite or in spite, but it, which it could be too. But it's it's basically like these ones 
performed the best and they were not uh they didn't have these restrictions at the same time there's like other platforms like you know sofi people are going there and i just don't know how honest that transition is to go to sofi for example like maybe they just don't have that many users so they have no problem right so it's hard to tell if they actually have the infrastructure like a fidelity obviously would have had that infrastructure so yeah i think fidelity and vanguard really need to work on their mobile interface people like me who you know look at charge can you know use it do it on mobile because I, I'm not, you know, sometimes I'm not with my computer. Because Weeble is fantastic on mobile, so that's kind of my, uh, that's that's how I judge other uh, application, trading applications, is just looking at Weeble's mobile application and from that. And I don't think anyone else has come close to Weeble. That's a good point. I know that um, e- E-Trade has a somewhat new mobile platform but i don't know haven't tried it myself if it's any good weeble is a pretty good platform i think i think it's really good for trading in terms of the analysis that they have as well the only thing with weeble is that the foreign ties that they have if if one is worried about potential personal data that kind of stuff but there's always a catch to these free platforms so there's there's that and i guess the the last thing i want to talk about here is do you have any thoughts and, and restrictions that should happen? Like, what are your views on shorting? Should there be a limit to shorting? Should shorting be outlawed? Things like that. Uh, I'm I'm fine with shorting. It, it plays it, it plays its it does it has its function in the market uh, to you know incentivize people to find frauds and you know it, even if you're a trader if you think the price is going to go down. You make money off of that, so I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But regulation-wise, I saw how I saw that Janet Yellen got got her ethics waiver for <laughs> her talk, which yeah, I sent you that the uh, article where uh, even though Citadel paid her uh, what was it eight hundred and ten thousand dollars for a speech, uh, she's still on the case. So I don't think. I want any more regulations. Uh, I would like them to, you know, get rid of the day trading to twenty five under the twenty five thousand uh, dollar minimum for day trading. Uh, the T plus two regulations, especially, because that's what kind of caused this whole problem. Yeah, I think the I think the day trading regulation would be like the opposite of things that might happen. Basically. They're going to put more regulation than less, but I think that's absolutely right about um, shorting. I think shorting is really needed. First of all, if there was, if we took the tools away from bears, the fact that there are bears in the stock market is actually a big part of why I'm bullish. If there was no bears, I would actually be pretty bearish. Yeah, it, yeah. It also helps the price go up. Help exactly. It helps the price go up. If everyone is bullish by like de facto or forced to be more bullish, then that's kind of a scary scenario to me, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, the, um, what I don't like the most is the accredited investor rule. That's that is, true. That is, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's the one I don't like the most. And the whole thing with the regulators and, you know, like with Janet Yellen and, and things like that, because in my, my view, it, it's, you know, for Robinhood, we're not necessarily the customers because it's the people who pay their order flow. For Facebook, we're not the customers. It's like the people who pay their ads. And then also for like our, our politicians, we don't pay them. It's the different entities that are paying them tons of money. And so who's more likely to be regulated? These uh, hedge funds or the retail investor? Probably us. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Yeah. They need to you know fix that. And SEC really needs to, you know, wake up because they've been pretty much asleep at the wheel this entire time. And all of a sudden, you know, they're like, yeah, we, we're going to regulate now after not doing anything for past, what, nine months. And like you said, if there's something that's going to cause a great financial crisis or something like that, yeah, we might want to patch that uh, hole in the wall before it, it gets too bad. So that if there's something like that in terms of, going over the you know like with GameStop apparently they're saying that that they could have caused this huge liquidity issue so if there is something like that sure you can patch a little hole but that's that's about it yeah so another thing about the short squeeze that bothered me with the 
the the media covering it was uh, how they said that uh, AMC and BlackBerry were short squeezes somehow, which BlackBerry didn't have much of a short percentage to actually cause a squeeze. And it also has 554 million for their free float. And AMC has 284 million free float. So I didn't really think retail has much of a, you know, moving power in in those stocks. And Nokia was, like, the worst. Like, you could tell that they're lying because uh, Nokia has 5.62 billion uh, for their free, free float, and their market cap is 25 billion, even though they're in penny stock territory. So, and the move to, what, this $9.79 that that cannot be retail whatsoever. What I'm hearing right now, it's actually because there's the other obvious thing that the hedge funds were on both ends. But this is what I'm thinking about right now from what you're saying. And because I've also been hearing Vlad constantly talk about this social media aspect, right? That this has, we've been having so much chatter about these stocks. And what is causing the buying from all the chatter on social media? I'm just realizing this right now, actually. It's kind of like this epiphany. When you have so much chatter, like, for example, the Signal incident, when you have so much chatter, like Elon tweets out saying, oh, everyone should download the Signal app, right? And there's so much chatter about Signal, and then Signal's stock price goes up thousands of percent. The question I have here, is it the dumb retail investors that are pumping that, or is it an algorithm based on social media and how much something gets talked about that's pushing the stock up? So when you have so much people talking about Nokia... So much people talking about GameStop. Is it really, obviously the retail investors have some play, but is it the algorithms that are kind of more at fault here that are jumping onto this like they were on Signal, like they were on this, you know, Zoom, when Zoom video was going to IPO, this like Z-O-O-M stock went up massively. Is it really the retail investors that are so dumb or is it the, these algorithms that are pulling all this data in and jumping into these stocks when they see the out when they see basically this data plus a spike in price and then it just boom all this money goes into the, these positions yeah uh, it's uh, some of these stocks that you, you can tell it's more of you know the algorithms that are combing through social media and uh, uh and then the order flow from robin hood and whatnot to front run the trade so uh, especially when you have stocks like nokia with their humongous float, because uh, when because on when I used to be on uh, the penny stock subreddits, uh, the the rule was kind of to look for stocks with a twenty to fifty million float. Like fifty million should be like the max. Like you shouldn't really be going above that because it's harder and the squeeze isn't uh, as good. So it, it, it's easy to tell when it's uh, retail versus um like the algorithms buying it. super true and we're getting to the end of the, the interview is there anything else that you want to mention at all from your experience here before we wrap this up yeah uh the news and boy did we see a lot of fake news at that and what type of fake news are you talking about in terms of um if people aren't aware of what's going on uh so we had CNBC uh, saying that Melvin covered their short position, and then you had Melvin on their website saying they don't comment on their positions. And the odd thing was that CNBC started to uh, promote these ads on Twitter that said that shorts had covered their position. And then after the weekend, we saw pretty much all all the news outlets just hammer this uh they saw they, they put this narrative out there that retail was causing a silver short squeeze in silver which if you know anything about uh, uh silver futures or uh, that being traded you know that jp morgan heavily manipulates the price of silver and they've gotten fined over this multiple times but it doesn't matter to them because they're making billions and paying millions and you know, fines. So th that's not really a big problem for them. 
And that, yeah, that had got the silver squeeze thing was, you know, just this. It kind of made me just hate it more because you you go on to uh, r slash stocks and r slash investing, even Wall Street bets. You had people saying don't buy silver, and like that was one of the top posts. And interesting. I mean, so it seems like there was someone trying to take advantage if of retail investors jumping onto the next thing. Because you saw them jumping on his GameStop, you saw them then going onto AMC, and then there was a push to, okay, let's get people to jump onto Silver, for example, or something like that. Yeah, it seemed yeah. Like. And then, yeah, and this whole thing, the it was just GameStop that Wall Street Bets was focused on. And then uh, Media did... Uh, what was also like uh, not good was how they treated the saying that Reddit investors were causing the short squeeze because there have got to be other like hedge funds that have like noticed this 140 percent short float and then you know they're like yeah we see the price going up let's get in and you can tell by the volume. I'm sure a lot of people who work at hedge funds are taking a look at what's happening at Wall Street Bets. Yeah, and then, uh, so the last point is. Uh, how they treated the this whole GameStop, AMC, BlackBerry thing compared to the silver squeeze, or quote-unquote silver squeeze, uh, it, it went from, wow, retail is stupid and bad, and they need help to you know trade, to, wow, look at them go, aren't they the best? Wait, so they were commending the silver squ- squeeze, is that right? Uh, I wouldn't say they were openly commending it. It was uh, it was more like you can see how they're treating it versus the original. Interesting. Or versus like GameStop and these other stocks. They're like, wow, Silver is up today on Reddit investors getting on board to buy Silver. Interesting. I, I would buy. I would buy the Doge aspects, you know. But but uh, Silver, I, I'm not sure oh, about boy. Silver. <laughs> Silver, I, I, I think, yeah, I like silver, too. That's the thing. And then as soon as I saw the news, I was like, no, that can't happen. J.P. Morgan is manipulating the prices. There's, there's no way they're going to let retail win. Yeah, and then Dogecoin, that was another whole thing that happened, which I didn't get into because I don't like Dogecoin, but yeah. Some crazy things that are happening. And again, I really appreciate taking your time to talk on this interview. and. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch. And one thing I'm just going to say is that, you know, that none of this is financial advice. I'm just some random guy on YouTube, and, and this is a uh, college student, and, you know, this is just uh, for entertainment purposes only. And uh, good, good trading, and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thanks again for coming on.